Imagine a business where it takes up to 15 years to develop a single product. But almost all of your projects fail anyway. A successful development project can cost up to a billion dollars. If you make a serious mistake, people die. Regulatory agencies all over the world govern every step of the process. You have to succeed two or three times a year just to stay even. And everyone thinks your products cost way too much. So this, in a nutshell, is the pharmaceutical industry. Yet despite these challenges, researchers at Merck and other companies continue to discover and develop innovative new medicines that positively impact human health. Genuvia is one such new medicine. Citagliptin, the active ingredient in Genuvia, is an inhibitor of the enzyme dipeptidylpeptidase 4, or DPP4. Genuvia was the first DPP4 inhibitor approved by the FDA for the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes. The Genuvia family, which is number one in sales in the oral diabetes market, also includes Janumet, which is a fixed-dose combination of Citagliptin and metformin, the gold standard therapy for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Now, there were a number of factors when taken together turned a small idea that Nancy and I had into the best-selling product family in Merck's history, which has been prescribed over 50 million times in the U.S. alone. And it's those factors that we want to talk to you about tonight. So behind every important product is a huge unmet need. And I think that we've heard examples of that um, tonight. Um, in the case of type 2 diabetes, I think all of you are aware that type 2 diabetes is a global epidemic. And that's really illustrated in this, uh, in this slide. So there are currently more than 350 million people with type 2 diabetes, and that number is projected to increase to almost 600 million by 2030. That's driven largely by the increased prevalence of obesity, and as you can see, particularly in the, in the emerging markets, due to the adoption of a Western diet. Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness, kidney disease, and amputation. Now importantly, in 1999, when we started the program, as today, there's an unmet need for new therapies for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And that's despite the fact that there really currently are available a number of therapies for type 2 diabetes. But this is, the evidence for this is that most type 2 diabetes, or rather 50% of type 2 diabetics, are not well controlled. That is, about 50% do not achieve their, blood, their target blood glucose levels. So clear unmet need for new therapies for type 2 diabetes, and Merck recognized this unmet need and made a major commitment to identify these therapies, which ultimately resulted in the Genuvia program. Now let's talk about empowerment as a second factor for the success of this program. And by empowerment, I mean leveraging the talent and the experience of those around you and those in the labs um, to really come up with an innovative product. And in this case, the empowerment refers to the initiation of the Genuvia program, where Anne and I, as scientists in the labs, were empowered by the leadership of the company to really think about new targets and do the research required to get a target and a project off the ground. So before I talk about the start of the program, I just want to briefly describe the mechanism of action of this drug. So in response to, to eating, um, the intestine releases a number of hormones that are involved in the regulation of feeding behavior and glucose. And two such hormones are GLP-1 and GIP. These are called incretin hormones. And so how do these hormones work? Well, they in turn are responsible for the um, release of other, or the um, regulation of other important hormones involved in glucose regulation, specifically insulin that I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, GLP-1 and GIP secrete insulin, or result in the um, release of insulin from the pancreas. And glucagon, which is another hormone that's important in glucose control, 
is also regulated by GLP-1. And together, these two hormones result in a decrease in uh, plasma glucose or blood glucose. Now, these hormones, when they're released from the intestine, are very rapidly inact inactivated. And the enzyme responsible for their inactivation is dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4. So how does citagliptin or Genuvia work? Well, it's an enzyme inhibitor. It blocks the action of the DPP4 enzyme, resulting in an increased level of both GLP-1 and GIP, resulting in a decrease in blood glucose. And so we and others were excited about this approach because it offered the promise for oral therapy, a low risk of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, and that's because both GLP-1 and GIP only work when blood glucose levels are high and no weight gain. Now, in terms of the start of the program, in 1999, I assumed responsibility for a relatively small but highly talented group of biologists. And we were looking around for something to do. And so I went out and I talked to a number of internal scientists, um, internal leaders at Merck, and um, external scientists. And it was really based on that I became aware of some really provocative data around GLP-1 and DPP-4. Specifically, validation of GLP-1 as, as a target for type 2 diabetes and also evidence that DPP-4 was the enzyme involved in the regulation of this hormone. And then finally, external scientists had actually done experiments with DPP-4 inhibitors in animals and showed that they could control glucose. And based on that, I decided to start an exploratory biology program. And, as luck would <laughs> have it, around that time, I was also looking for a new project for my group. So Nancy and I had lunch one day, and we thought it might be really fun to work on this project together. And so we did. <laughs> so that leads us to the next factor that we felt feel is uh, really a major contributor to the success of this product, and that is tractability. And in my career at, at Merck, I learned that it's really, really important to have a balanced portfolio, a, a balanced portfolio with respect to risk. That is, it's okay to have some hard projects, but it's really important to have some projects that are readily tractable. And this falls into that category. So why was this project so tractable? Well, as I mentioned, it was a clinically validated target. It was chemically tractable, and Anne's going to talk a little bit more about this, but basically we knew ahead of time that it was possible to design small molecule inhibitors of this enzyme that were likely to have good drug properties. We knew, again, from external science that there was excellent conservation of the biology from mouse to man, and this is really critical, and this is not true in all disease areas. However, with respect to this particular biology, we knew that was the case, so we could use our animal models in order to determine the probabilities of, of success of the compounds that were made in Ann's group and test their properties. And then finally, this is a really clinically tractable target. That is, as with many other diabetes targets, there are lots of things that can be measured very early in clinical development, in short-term and small studies, in order to get a handle as to whether, again, your compound has a chance to actually be a drug. Tenacity, resiliency, the ability to turn a setback into an opportunity. This was really critical to the success of this program. Very early on, we had a major setback. When we in-licensed a compound, one of the very early clinical candidates, from ProBioDrug. Now, ProBioDrug had done one-month safety studies in the dog. And so one of the first things that we did when we brought that compound in-house was to initiate chronic toxicity studies. Everything was fine for the first month. And then toward the end of the fifth week, we got a phone call. The dogs had started to die. This is never good. So <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, things like this can sometimes just kill a whole program. But instead, with the support of our management, we set out to try to understand the cause of this toxicity and then figure out a way that we could get around it. And as it turned out, the probiodrug compound 
was a non-selective inhibitor of DPP-4. So in other words, it not only blocked DPP-4, it also blocked two related enzymes, DPP-8 and DPP-9. Now this produced glucose lowering as we had, um, had wanted, but the consequence also involved this um, un unanticipated preclinical toxicity. Now at the same time, we were able to show that a selective DPP-4 inhibitor, one that only blocked the DPP-4 enzyme but didn't touch DP-8 or DPP-9, showed the same glucose control but now without the toxicity. So it was really this knowledge that enabled us to design the right molecule to bring forward into the clinic. So that brings me to the next factor, and that's really truly having an innovative product. So drug discovery is an iterative process. It starts with designing and synthesizing a compound. We then evaluate all the properties of that compound, assimilate a vast amount of information about that compound, and then as medicinal chemists, we try to figure out what structural features of the molecule we can change to improve the properties and really give us something that we want. And with that information, then we design the next compound and so on and so on, and we go around and around. And in fact, on this particular program, it took about 2,000 compounds for us to come up with citagliptin. And before we actually shut this program down, we had made well over 10,000 compounds. So this enabled us to take a lead molecule optimize a wide variety of properties, many of which were dependent on, on each other, and come up with a drug candidate. And citagliptin is a highly optimized compound. As, as Nancy likes to say, it's a great molecule, <laughs> and I would have to agree with her. <laughs> and this really enabled us to move forward into the clinic with very minimal compound-related issues. And that brings us to teamwork. Teamwork is so important in any innovation. In, in, well, in the, I think most innovations, and certainly in innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. And the teamwork on this program was extraordinary. The, that's really reflected on the next slide, where you can look at the timeline for development for Genuvia. This is one of the fastest programs in Merck history as exemplified by this timeline, which compares the timeline for clinical development of Genuvia versus the typical timeline uh, for discovery and development at that time um, for just the average timeline for um, drug programs. Now, why did this program move so quickly? Well, I think there were three major reasons. First, management um, was fully committed to, Merck really was fully committed to identify new therapies for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, so they resourced this program properly. Second, we had a great molecule, and great what? molecule, <laughs> um, and really didn't run into any molecule-specific issues to hang up development. But finally, the teamwork was absolutely extraordinary. We believed in the mission, we believed in the molecule, and we really worked incredibly well together in order to bring this important, promising new um, product forward to see if it really had the legs uh, to be a drug. So um, I think it was one of the highlights of our career for sure, working with both the discovery team and the um, clinical development team on this project. We also um, were really working, we were joined at the hip with the commercial team almost um, completely through the development program. And that brings me to the last major factor for the um, success of Genuvia, which is life cycle management. So as I mentioned, uh, the Genuvia program was one of the fastest in Merck history. It was a highly focused program, a relatively small clinical program. However, um, we've done a huge amount of work since then to really optimize the value of this molecule for patients. And that's reflected on this slide. And I'm obviously not going to go through this, but what you can see in the red panel is the initial core phase three program, relatively small, highly focused. But it's really what happened after the approval of Genuvia in 2006 that maximizes the value of this product for patients with type 2 diabetes. And that program included the fixed dose combination Janumet that Anne referred to. 
It included studies in a number of different patient populations to really understand the value there, and in a number of different dosing paradigms. For example, um, diabetes treatment often requires combination therapy to get patients to their glycemic goal. So we looked at Genuvia in combination with virtually every other important oral agent and also with insulin. In fact, Merck continues to leverage the experience gained in this program with um, an, another really innovative program that we have around a different molecule, which is a once-weekly DPP-4 inhibitor, omarogliptin. Genuvia has been prescribed to millions of patients in over 90 countries around the world. And this type of impact has been recognized with a number of, of awards, including the pre gallian USA Award in 2007, which is considered the Nobel Prize of the industry. The manufacturing process won the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge for being particularly environmentally friendly. Our team celebrated success. This was a team that loved to party. <laughs> and it's really that celebration of success, along with the factors that we um, discussed tonight, that we think are really applicable to anyone with a small idea that wants to turn that into an innovative product and bring that product to customers. Ann and I really have a passion for contributing to human health, and it was an incredible privilege to work on this program with such an amazing, talented group of clinicians, um, um, our, our commercial colleagues, in order to bring this promising new therapy to patients. Um, we hope that this, um, again, that these lessons will be applicable to your work. We wish you the best of luck in everything that you're doing, and thanks so much for your attention tonight.